Hey, greetings, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West. College football season is right around the corner. Welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. You got to light them up before they burn it down. Better dig deep and put them in the ground. But on their hands, they're hell bound. Save us all. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Steadfast and Law podcast. And the theme for the podcast this week is federalism. And as I stated in the monologue that you will be seeing, a lot of people don't understand that word federalism. And that shows how the, the lack of literacy we have about our Constitution and relationship between the federal government and our states. But one young man from down in South Florida, Mr. Elad Hakim, is an attorney and columnist. His articles have been published in the Washington Examiner, the Daily Caller, the Federalist, American Thinker, and other online publications. He is also a regular guest on One America News Network's Tipping Point and has appeared on Newsmax, The Dave Weinbaum Show, and Real America's Voice. Elad, Thanks so much for joining us here on the Steadfast and Law podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I tell you, this is a great uh, you know article that you wrote, and and I'll just start off with the uh, first portion in the Federalist Number Forty Five. James Madison wrote in part, "The powers dele- delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government." are few and defined, and we talked about that, Article 1, Section 8. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. Notwithstanding Madison's famous words, President Joe Biden and Democrats in Congress are trying to systematically invalidate and or usurp some of the rights belonging to the individual states in their quest for unfettered power. Tell us really the crux of your argument here uh, in this this article that you brought forward? Well, the gist of the argument is, and I brought up two examples, you know, Mm -hmm. the the two most recent examples are one voting and two abortion. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, real real quickly, the, the constitution sets forth that issues regarding voting, the time, place, and manner with respect to voting belong to the states. It's specifically in the constitution. It allows Congress to kind of get involved, but when Congress does that, it's, it's relatively infrequent. Normally, mm-hmm. uh, it's up to the states. So what did the Democrats do? The Democrats went ahead and proposed H.R. 1, you know, the Voting Rights Act. Yep. And what did it do? The Democrats at that point tried to federalize the election system. They tried to take away the, uh, the, the constitutional rights that the states have to determine the time, place and manner of elections and to federalize them. Uh, So I bring up that point of the article. And then the second point and kind of the more recent and more pressing point uh, deals with abortion. You know, everyone uh, was going gung ho over the court's recent uh, the Supreme Court's recent ruling in Dobbs. Uh, You know, I should add a couple things. One, I've never seen more people mischaracterize the holding Mm -hmm. of Dobbs. Uh, You know, the Dobbs court, Supreme Court, all the Supreme Court said was, hey, the issue of abortion is not in the Constitution. It's, it can't find a home under substantive due process. It can't find a home under the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, and because of that, it's the Supreme Court basically says, hey, we're, it's not in our jurisdiction. It belongs to the states and the state legislatures to decide. Great. So what do we have then? Not, you know, shortly after that, uh, Democrats uh, went ahead and uh, ironically, they blamed Justice Thomas uh, for trying to codify. And just so your audience understands, Justice Thomas issued a concurring opinion in which he said, I agree with the majority opinion, but I would take things a step further. I don't believe in the notion of substantive due process. And because of that, I recommend that we reevaluate some of the other rights that we've held fit under substantive due process. For example, same-sex marriage, uh, the use of contraceptives. And 
he didn't call for getting rid of them. He called to reevaluate them and see if we can find a different home in the Constitution to hold that they're valid. Uh, but it can't be under substantive due process. So after that, Democrats went ahead and now they're trying to codify uh, abortion. So again, they're taking a an issue that the Supreme Court specifically said, this belongs to the states. And now they're trying to codify it. And it can make a difference because, you know, you have uh, the supremacy clause and you have uh, issues where federal, you know, if there's a disagreement, so to speak, between a federal law and a state law, the federal law typically trumps uh, trumps the state law. So, for example, let's assume that a state has uh, an abortion law that says, OK, after 15 weeks, you can't have an abortion. If the codification goes through and it says, no, after uh, there, any anti-abortion uh, law that's, uh, that's, uh, that says uh, 24 weeks or before that is invalid. So then you have an issue where you have a state law conflicting with the federal codification and it's going to create a problem. So in those two instances, you have uh, cases where the federal government is just trampling on the rights that are given to the states. Well, the interesting thing is you bring up the supremacy clause, but as I read the supremacy clause, as long as the federal government is following the Constitution, then yes, uh, what they are you know, handing down is supreme over the states. But if they're doing things that are not constitutional, and obviously the, the Supreme Court has made a decision saying that you're coloring outside the lines with this. And this has to go back down to the states. And so they are ruling according and interpreting uh, the law. And so if the federal government all of a sudden, and, and this is what I think the real issue is, Elad, is that the left believes in ideological rights. They don't believe in constitutional rights. They believe that their ideological agenda sets the stage for, you know, how everything should be. And it should come down from on high. Uh, and, and that's the big issue. And so let's kind of start going back to the voting rights uh, issue, because all of a sudden in the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and this was kind of comical because John Lewis was my congressional representative growing up in Atlanta. They're telling states that, you know, we're going to do everything by universal mail in ballots. We're just going to mail out, you know, unsolicited ballots. That's not in their purview. As a matter of fact, you drill it down below the states. It's really counties that are executing, uh, you know, elections. And so what makes them feel, other than the fact that they want power control, that they can just push aside the Constitution, push aside the Tenth Amendment, where it clearly says that those powers not specifically delegated to the federal government are reserved there to the states and to the people. And I don't see running elections uh, one of the things, going back to Article One, that's under the purview of the federal government. No, you're 100 percent right. And I think that the primary thing, the, the primary reason they're doing so is because of the breakdown of Congress now. And I should add, unfortunately, they have the blessing of some Republicans, um, which is very unfortunate. I mean, I don't know how often you see, short of someone like Joe Manchin, how often are we seeing Democrats splinter? It doesn't no. happen very often. No. Uh, but unfortunately, we have uh, Republicans that are kind of giving them their blessings on some of these issues. Um, but it, it just highlights, again, how important it is now, uh, come November, uh, to to get out and vote and to try to, to change the, the, the balance of power in Congress. Otherwise, we're going to systematically be losing uh, or eroding our constitutional rights. I mean, look what's happening with the Second Amendment. Yes. Uh, you know, the Republicans and Democrats kind of came up with some sort of bipartisan bill, although I'm surprised that Republicans did that. And what happened? You know, the begging question was, OK, you came up with this bill. What's going to happen with the, when the next shooting happens? The next shooting happened. And what happened? It was predictable. They're calling for more regulations. Mm -hmm. So it's consistently trying to erode the Constitution, the, the constitutional rights. Um, they, they don't, you know, for some reason they don't believe in the Constitution. Now they're, they're kind of creating it as they go along. Yeah, it's, you know, I say that lots of times they believe in a court institution. You know, when, when they can't get their way through the legislative process, they just run to a court. And, you know, that's why it's so important that we focus on these uh, judicial elections, you know, down at our local level, definitely our state level. And, of course, making sure that we have the right type of president, because now we have a 
constitutional Supreme Court. And that's driving the left absolutely apoplectic. And it's funny you bring up the Second Amendment thing because the the young man, the 22-year-old that ended the shooting up there in that mall in Indiana, you didn't hear a peep. I mean, the left didn't want to talk about that. You know, but but, you know, they continue to want to talk about Uvalde until we find out that the police were dithering around for 77 minutes. So, you know, if you had someone that was armed and trained, which the Second Amendment talks about, the well-regulated militia means the well-trained people. uh, And that's necessary for the security of the free state. The other thing let's talk about, because I'm here in Texas uh, and when we see how our border is wide open, and then you read the H.R. 1 where it said that uh, voter registration roll review will be illegal, outlawed. You can't do that anymore. Hello, McFly. You know, there's no coincidences with uh, tyrants. No. And, you know, I wrote a piece about this a while ago. And, you know, I was always under the belief that the whole purpose for keeping the borders open for the Democrats is votes. They are mm-hmm. under the impression that. People coming in from other countries will vote Democrat. And uh, and you saw, you know, they wanted to fast track uh, citizenship. Now they're pushing to allow non-citizens to vote. You know, in mm. New York, uh, a court pushed back and said no. Uh, but they're looking to do it throughout the country. You know, at the end of the day, it might backfire because a lot of the people that are coming in from countries outside of ours are fleeing countries that implement the very policies mm-hmm. that the Democrats are pushing now. Uh, you know, the Democrats of old are gone. You know, you have a far left extreme version of, of the Democrat Party. And uh, you see, like, look at the Hispanic vote. I can tell yes. you not Miami Dade, the Hispanic vote, it, it support they supported Trump a great, you know, a, you know, a lot more than, than they did the, you know, in the past. And uh, I think that Biden is going to have the same fate. They are rejecting the policies that they're too extreme. No, you're absolutely right. So how can Republicans do better? Because, you know, winning the House and Senate, all great. But if you don't get back to governing according to the Constitution, and one of the things that I see that is very disconcerting is the use of executive action. It's almost, and this is a bipartisan problem, it's almost to the point where we have relegated the legislative branch to be irrelevant. Absolutely. I agree with you 100 percent. And it is something, like you said, that is utilized too much and too often by all presidents. Um, and, you know, your readers have to understand that uh, or your, your listeners that an executive order is not, so to speak, a law. Um, oh. it, you know, it uh, you know, Biden came out and issued an executive order when it comes to abortion. And uh, I think uh, all it really did was kind of try to appease those mm-hmm. uh those far lefters who were very, very who were traumatized by the Dobbs decision. But it, it doesn't, you know, so I agree with you. It, it's not law. And I think what's going to happen is that uh, once the Republicans, assuming they do take over, they're going to shred that executive order yeah. um, or get rid of it. But what can Republicans do? Listen, I don't think there's much they can do now. I mean, even if they do very well in November, I think the best they can hope to do is to kind of lame duck Biden until, you know, the next presidential election. I mean, it's going to take some time to to get out of what he's done. And, you know, my biggest concern, you hear these this talk of a red wave. I just hope the elections are fair. I mean, you know, I know that states are passing all these laws, but, you know, the laws don't mean anything if people don't abide by them and people don't enforce them. And, you know, not to kind of touch upon a sour subject, but you do worry. I do worry about that. I mean, you worry about it. You hear too many examples of, of things going on throughout the country. And you would think that given what's going on in the country now, you can't imagine that Republicans wouldn't do well. But we've seen stranger things. Yeah. Um, when you when you talk about the, 
the ballot harvesting and and all the other little chicaneries, the drop boxes that are out there. And it reminds me of the quote that's attributed to Joseph Stalin. It's not the person that cast the ballot that matters. It's the person that counts the ballot that matters. And so hopefully we've corrected this. You know, let's close it out on another issue where I think federalism has to be restored. And that's in our system of education, which now is a system of indoctrination. And, you know, the federal government has no jurisdiction and purview when it comes to education. That's not something that's an enumerated power to them. But yet what they always do, they create a department and therefore they think that, well, we created an agency. So now we have control over it. And when I look at what is happening in education in the United States of America and parents are pushing back, this is a great opportunity for us to talk about that right balance with the 10th Amendment, because that's why you have school boards at the local level. Correct. And, you know, I think that my home state, the state of Florida, mm-hmm. is the perfect example of a governor pushing back against efforts to, you know, at, to implement wokeism and to sexualize our children. You know, uh, I, I don't know how much you know about what's going on in Florida, but oh, Governor DeSantis has really pushed back. You know, they labeled, you know, whether you it's, mean the don't say gay, you know, bill. yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the quote unquote don't say gay bill. So they are really pushing yeah. back and trying to give the power back to the parents, yes. um, you know, parents that have a right to see what their kids are going to be learning in school. Parents have a, have a right to see what books and materials are kept in libraries at school. And that's the way it should be. I mean, they are trying to take the place of uh, of parents, uh, you know, the left. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's insane what is happening. And I think that many states should replicate at least red states. There's no chance blue states are going to do it. But red states should replicate what Governor DeSantis is doing, um, because it's having a a profound impact in Florida. Well, the nature of socialism is to nationalize production, you know, every aspect of our lives. And that's what you see happening from, you know, forcing us toward electric vehicles, what's happening with our economy, what's happening with food. I mean, you name it. And so that's why I think that, you know, what you wrote was so important. And how can people follow and, you know, see some of the other things that you're writing out there? I mean, your website, what have you? Find me on Twitter, uh, so long as I can still have a following (laughs) Uh, Elad Hakim. Um, otherwise, at Thoughtfully Conservative on Facebook. And uh, otherwise, just look me up, you know, if you have any legal questions. Well, I really appreciate you because, you know, the thing that the left will say is that young minority p- people should not be conservative or even old black guys like me should not be conservative. So I think that we're starting to break through things because you're right. The people that are coming here from, are coming and escaping countries where they had that centralized planning and control. They don't want that. So I think that it could backfire, but we have got to have effective communications, and that's why your voice is so important and what you're writing and what you're talking about. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the Steadfast and Loyal podcast, Elad Hakeem, and God bless you and God be with you. Thanks so much. My pleasure. You got it. Take care. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the Steadfast and Loyal podcast. And just a special shout out and thanks to Elad Hakim of Delray Beach, Florida, and him talking about his article about federalism and restoring that right relationship. So please hit that like button and share us with your friends. God bless you and thank you for watching. Before they burn it down.